Hi, uh, so this is the start part two of Kierkegaard's Works of Love, and I asked you to take a look at a reading, which I'm um, imagining you found pretty, pretty confusing. So here's a secret to how to read Kierkegaard then. Look back at where you see the next um, or the previous italics. And the previous italics is on page 54 of your book, where it says, only when it is a duty to love, only then is love eternally and happily secured against despair. One might imagine that you have loved or tried to love, either in the context of loving someone who doesn't love you back, whether that be a partner, a romantic partner, or whether it be uh, a child or a parent, or perhaps someone that you've tried to help as a pastor or as a, a counselor. And it feels like you're not getting anywhere. And remember, love is not necessarily romantic. It feels as though you don't make the connection. You're not feeling like you're able to love. And here it says only when it is a duty to love can then love be eternal and it is happily secured against despair. So in this couple of pages, he talks about the ways in which we often feel that we love. And yet, when love is lost, or when love does not lead to anything in return, we feel in despair. We perhaps mourn. We still feel something fiery in the heart, and yet it is cold and hurts. There is something of the blend of that. He says, you shall love. The you shall of the eternal is the saving element. It is the purifying and the elevating moment. Perhaps you mourn. Perhaps what you're mourning is the loss of love through death, through unrequitedness, through not being able to fulfill what it is you think that the love is demanding, through not being loved back. And you sorrow. And the sorrow, he says, is both true and beautiful. And you think you have the right to sorrow and the right to despair. But in fact, you have been called. You have been said you ought to love. And that despair and that sorrow if it is strong, perhaps it's because you're loving, because that love that you're giving does not feel like it is being returned. You ought to preserve yourself, but really you ought to preserve the love. This is part of what Kierkegaard is getting at in this struggle between what it is you humanly want what, as Luther might say, the flesh is weak. Um, I think it's Paul, actually, but Luther highlights it because Kierkegaard is Lutheran. The flesh is weak. The spirit is strong. But the flesh wants return. But he calls us to remember that eternal love cannot fail. It is only you that can fail to incarnate your internal love, this eternal love. So even if you feel the despair, because that love is not returned, it has not been effective, as you name it. Maybe it's been effective and it's hidden. Because what's really important is that you are the one called to love. It's not about what the results are in terms of whether or not the person does what you want them to do. It's, it's that you have loved. And that love has undergone the change. Eternal love has undergone the change of eternity from ordinary human love and is eternally secured against every change. 
doesn't need to be tested as often the love songs test the love. Do you love me as high as the mountains, as deep as the valleys? Nor can it become hatred or jealousy or apathy. Eternal love does not become hatred or jealousy. It is eternally made free from the reaction of the object. It is in blessed independence from the object's response or result of the love that you've given. And it is eternally secured against despair. So the second section uh, is you shall love your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor. So who's the neighbor? Beautiful day in the neighborhood. Who is the other? The neighbor is the other. But who is the other? Is it all others? Well, that seems abstract. You just love all others. Is it any other? Anyone you choose? Is it the one you meet? The one right in front of you? If you're struggling to lose weight, you need to see this right now. A breakthrough five second ice hack has just been discovered that. encourage you to listen to the whole thing um, as it, it is on the, the PowerPoint. But to love the one you're with, love the one that is right in front of you. It's not romantic love, however, it's Christian love. Love the one that is in need right in front of you, the one who needs help. This is the neighbor to whom you are to extend love. So the neighbor is everyone, anyone that you run into that needs help. The object of our work of love is dependent upon God's command and not upon our own preference. Who we love is not about us, nor about some characteristic of the other, which again is only really only our response to that characteristic, but it's about God's eternal call and command to love. Now, Kierkegaard talks a little bit about this preferential love versus eternal love, um, actually talks quite a bit about it. And I encourage you to reflect upon it because it's hard to get your head around um, when it comes down to it. Is that love based on a preference is preferential love. And that's the typical kind of love and, and attention and affection that we have. It's usually only for a specific object of our own affection, our own interest. Whereas love that's based on the command to love is based upon that command to love one's neighbor. The middle term, and we've talk, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, between in my preferential love is my preference. It's the shape of my heart and, and my interest. Whereas in eternal love, it is the middle term is God. In preferential love, one is dependent upon my own, it is, it is dependent upon my own likes and dislikes. I like blue, I don't like orange. It is not dependent upon, uh, I'm sorry, eternal love, contrarily, 
is not dependent upon my own desire or my own interest. It's whoever's in front of me that needs the help. Preferential love, on the one hand, expects a return or a result, such as to be loved in return, such as I'm going to, you know, give a dinner party and I, I kind of expect that someone will give a dinner party and inv invite me the next time or the next year. And when that doesn't happen more than once, more than twice, I'm going to stop inviting them to my dinner party, typically. That's preferential love. Whereas love based on the command to love is accomplished and complete in the actual work of love. It doesn't expect a return. It doesn't expect a result. It's the work of love already accomplished. So preferential love, the boy or the girl has love for the particular object. And it's something about the object that he likes or she likes. Her shape, her smell, the things that she says, the things that she likes. Whereas an eternal love or Christian love, it goes through God first. The love goes through God first. One might even say it comes from God and then goes to the object, it goes through God, and then it is God's love, really, that's loving. It is God's love that is doing the love, not my preferential love. And this is Kierkegaard's view. In the next chapter, the third section, you shall love the neighbor is the focus. You are also a neighbor. You are loved. The command to love the neighbor, the command is to love the neighbor as yourself, and you are also loved. When we take away the distinctions between neighbors, None are lifted above the other, but neither are any pushed below the other. And this includes the self. This includes you. Love is a divine command that unites all humans in this single bond. Now, for Kierkegaard, this command to love actually changes the very being, the genetic or ontological, not, not really genetic, but I'm going to say ontological structure of the human being in reality itself. And ontological is something that is a, a metaphysical concept. It changes something eternal about you and about the other. Now, a couple terms that I just want to get clear for you as we continue with Kierkegaard's work here is that love is upbuilding. And I mentioned this before, but just it's very important. Love builds up. It's not merely building. It is upbuilding in that it indicates there is a depth as well as a height, rather than simply building from the ground or nothing. Thus, God's love is um, provides a foundation for us, a basement or undergirding of love. We're not just loved but we have an ability to love. That's the same for our neighbors. As one loves the neighbor through God's empowerment, the foundation of love within oneself deepens and the love that one gives to others can also grow higher. And as one loves others, the love that one has, that one, one that feels that God has for oneself also deepens. Love builds up by presuming that love is already present. That's a quote from Kierkegaard. Love builds up upon a foundation that is already present. Love knows that God's love is in within each person, not just that each is worthy of God's love, and that's true, each is worthy of God's love, but also that each is capable of God's love. Love upbuilds by presuming that love is already present, already loved, 
person is already loved by God and thus is already a subject of love and not merely an object of love as well. Love upbuilds by assuming that love is already present because God is the middle term. God is the empowerment for neighbor love. God is the focal point of all love. God is the guide for our ability to love and our loving. God is the reminder that you also are loved and capable of loving, and that so is your neighbor. And the neighbor is also the other, whether that neighbor is a stranger or a beloved one or a person you've known all your life or a friend. Kierkegaard writes toward the end of the book, love is the source of everything. And in a spiritual sense, love is the deepest ground of the spiritual life. In every human being in whom there is love, the foundation in the spiritual sense is laid. And the building that in the spiritual sense is to be erected is again love. And it is love that builds up. Love builds up. And this means it builds up love. Now, as we reflect upon Kierkegaard, we note there are a few controver controversial claims of Kierkegaard. And I encourage you to reflect upon these in terms of your own beliefs and your own understanding of your work as, do, as loving, whether that is in being a pastor, whether that is in preaching, whereas that, whereas even if that is in uh, preaching, I should say, even if that, regardless of whether that is in preaching, and that is in understanding and explaining to others what would commandment to love is, what the commandments are, but also in your work as minister, in your work as loving others, caring for others, and enabling others in your congregation to also love and care for each other and others. This is also the case if you are a pastoral counselor or a counselor in general, that you are about enabling your client to love. You are loving your client, holding regard for your client, and you are enabling them. You're seeing them as capable of love, and you are enabling them to see themselves as capable of love, as well as enabling them to love others. But there are some controversial claims of Kierkegaard. And so I encourage you to reflect upon these to see if this is, these are the beliefs that you have or the, the ways you have of thinking about it and what the implications are perhaps of it. First one is we love the neighbor through loving God, not loving God through loving the neighbor. Now, this is a controversy that many people have made the, arg the opposite argument. They have made the argument that we love God through loving our neighbors. We show God that we love God. We're following God's commandment by loving our neighbors. That God sees that we are loving God by loving our neighbors. This is really the process theology view as well. Although for process theology, one is loving God and loving neighbor at the same time. In this view, we humans have demonstrated that we are not too good. I'm sorry. We have not, we, we, um, I'm sure you will agree that we're not very good at loving our neighbors. We have not done a very good job as humans in general of loving our neighbors. Now, maybe you're very kind to your neighbors. Maybe you bring, bring in their mail or take out to bring in their garbage. Um, but most of us are not too kind to our neighbors in general, whether those neighbors be people from Ohio, people from um, Hendricks County, people next door, um, beliefs and ways in which we vote about folks from Mexico or from um, Europe or from the Ukraine or from Israel or from Africa, different countries in Africa or the Middle East or China, whatever it is, we don't usually think about our neighbors in general in this way. We've not been very good at doing that. Point two is that God's command to love our neighbor as ourselves, uh, which is given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai, it changes the very ontological structure of humans. This is what Kierkegaard is arguing. It changes the very structure of humans. Now, keeping this in mind, it means that without that command, 
we are incapable of loving as God loves. Means that's one. Two, so the way that we're created is not good enough. We have to be ontologically changed. Three, it's only about humans. It's not about loving any other creatures or any other parts of the earth or caring for any other parts of the earth. There may be some other objections. I encourage you to reflect upon those. Perhaps you think that we learn, I mean, many therapists um, have taken courses or taken books, read books that reflect upon the way that we, how we learn how to love is the, by the way that we are, we are shown love by our parents. And that without that love to our parents, without being good enough and without having good enough parents, we are not able to love. And this is what has caused a lot of problems in our world, is that we are, people are not capable of knowing how to love or even capable of loving. There are also folks that perhaps because of some mental illness or um, some kind of personality disorder do not follow this, do not are not capable of seeing others as with empathy and being able to have feelings of concern, concern, concern and compassion for others or to do anything that is helpful for others unless they're going to get something from it. Okay, that's controversial claim number one with several different points to it. Controversial claim number two is that loving the neighbor is about erasing earthly distinctions. And let me clarify that. It is about rising above the temptation to attend to one's own preferences and allow each individual to be each individual in and of themselves. Because love is not about attending to the other. Love is about attending to the other and not about attending to our own preferences. So does that mean that we should erase those earthly distinctions? Now, Kierkegaard thinks it's not about erasing those earthly distinctions, but rather thinks that it is about not giving particular value, different value to those earthly distinctions. Kierkegaard does not want to erase the distinctions between us. He wants the value that we've given to those distinctions to be erased or to be equalized so that you might love someone um, without wanting to see them in the, as same or, or exactly the same as another person because each person is distinct and each person has a different context. And that context is what shapes what it is they need. Some folks have argued that loving the neighbor is about erasing earthly distinctions. And this is not Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard does not want to erase them. He wants to erase the values that we give to those earthly distinctions. He does, he says, he does not say that in Christ there is no um, male or female, but rather erase the, the, the value given to being male or female. He does not want to make us all genderless. He does not want to make us all Greek or all Jew, or all free, or all slave, but rather to erase the distinctions that we have ascribed to those, that we have ascribed to class distinctions, that we have ascribed to gender distinctions, that we have ascribed to ethnic distinctions. So loving is not about treating everyone equally. Now this is Kierkegaard's claim. Loving is not about treating everyone equally. It's about treating everyone equally in terms of what they need. It's about loving everyone in terms, it's about meeting their needs equally. But meeting the needs of people are is different because people are different. They have different needs. Some people are more needy than others. Some people need different things than others. The things that some people need are more expensive than the things that other people need. Loving the neighbor is not about treating everyone equally. So let me continue with that. Some may interpret this uh, command to treat everyone equally, but that's not Kierkegaard's point. It's rather that each is to be loved equally. The love 
that, that each needs may be different according to the needs amongst the persons each um, and each person's needs. This call is to meet people where they are, not where you are or where you think they should be. The point is to love equally. Now, just as a summary, the works of love sees God as the source of love, which enables us to love. We love God first, and that enables us to love our neighbor. Our faith in God is what connects us to this empowering um, love that enables our fulfillment of the commandment to love. Second, Jesus as God is the example, or God as Jesus, I should say. Je God in the form of Jesus is the example for us to imitate in love. We love the neighbor. It's hard. It's confusing. And what does that mean? Um, we've talked about this. Third, God is the power by which we know we are loved as well. God is the ever-present reminder that we are a love, beloved status, and we are to love as we are loved. I encourage you to reflect upon any questions or comments you have for class and bring those to class. We will have um, a discussion here in our small groups. So I encourage you to look at that uh, that's in the PowerPoint if you want to get a, a heads up on what we're going to be doing in class uh, and um, reread uh, the Kierkegaard section, the section from Kierkegaard's book about giving a banquet for the poor. And we'll see you in class.